yes. Uh, when I was a child, um, you know, every, uh, every child uh, more or less like fairy tales, and I was no exception, so rather the opposite. Uh, but also in my family, we had people, uh, you know, that I trusted quite a lot who told about strange things. And uh, also I was a member of a Christian youth club and some of my trusted friends there also told me about, uh, say, experiences of telepathy, prayers answered, uh, illness healed and that kind of, say, paranormal stuff. And at that time, I somehow, uh, I was part of this Christian community and I somehow um, had that horizon of understanding, uh, you know, it was kind of thought typically, uh, I think that's quite normally in religious communities that the phenomena are explained more or less as, uh, say, uh, uh, acts of God, or if it be more scary phenomena, acts of uh, demonic uh, character. So, but that uh, kind of, uh, say, explanatory model did not uh, satisfy me because, you know, we had some Christian friends in Africa and they were praying for rain for their, their harvest, but did not get this rain, but some kind of, uh, say, uh, financial fundamentalist uh, American uh, preacher, you know, he got a pair of new shoes to his party, you know, so a God operating with that kind of priority list, you know, that would be very strange and even unethical. So, but how could I somehow uh, stick to that the phenomena were real, which I was quite convinced about because, as I said, trusted friends and family told me about them. And at the same time, letting go of the, the say, very limited and uh, limiting uh, explanatory model that I was given in my, my, my say, Christian youth club. Nothing wrong with those guys, but, you know, still much things they have not mapped uh, in a, say, satisfactory manner. So I started to look for other maps better describing the terrain. And I found that within uh, the esoteric traditions, you know, the Kabbalah, the Sufi, uh, Hermeticism, uh, Gnosticism, uh, the golden dawn and so and uh, magic of course and also later on I, I happened to meet some gypsy uh, say what is called fortune tellers and uh, I was both impressed and also a bit disappointed uh, because they could do something but the ego somehow inflated the whole thing and uh, they made much bolder claims that they than that I really could account for. But I, I, I continued and I eventually found some quite impressive psychic also and tested them with uh, asking questions and so. So, uh, and also when I was uh, at um, the university, I studied history of ideas and as a mentor, I got Professor Jan Erik Ebster Hansen and his publication list is long and wide and uh, more than 100 publications within the esoteric and mystical field, you know. So he is a serious, solid academic, but still uh, have been very interested in mapping these fields. So um, uh, by his, say, um, a kind of uh, initiative, I was uh, uh, turned into studying uh, anthroposophy, uh, the esoteric tradition stemming from the Austrian uh, occult uh, teacher Rudolf Steiner, uh, which many will know uh, through this world of school and uh, lots of different kind of, uh, say, culturally related initiative, a very philosophical kind of esotericism from Rudolf Steiner. His uh, background was in uh, theosophy, but he somehow uh, combined that much more and, and, and uh, linked it very much closer to the Western esoteric tradition. As most of our, our audience probably will know, uh, theosophy is more of the Eastern brand, basically. Madame Blavatsky. Uh, sources were mainly were mainly in the east, but uh, Rudolf Steiner combined that with uh, this uh, Western uh, esoteric tradition. So uh, then I also had become an academic, and from the childhood I had my personal existential interest for these phenomena. And at a point in time, I uh, presented some thoughts to. Uh, an experienced psychotherapist, a good friend of mine, and he said, you must make a book about this because it will be very helpful for many people. Uh, and how, how come? I said, yes, because it, people would tell him uh, going in therapy about this phenomena, but what he could say to them, what was that? Yes, it was strange. Oh, 
have you forgot your medication today or like that, you know. But by uh, reading my, oh, first listening to my ideas, he certainly saw a much more constructive frame for interpreting these phenomena. So he was strongly encouraging me to, to make this book and to make a long story short with quite a number of paranormal phenomena involved, which we can go into, if you like. Uh, I ended up with getting a scholarship, and uh, the book uh, came out in Norway, and um, it was quite well received also, in fact, by the Nor uh, Norwegian Medical uh, Journal, which is uh, exceptional, because most New Age, uh, say, stuff is not at all dealt with in the serious medical community, probably like in England. So, so I was quite happy with that. And I also went international with the book. And then it was the British quantum physicist, David Peat, his publishing house, which is a small one in Italy, uh, Pari Publishing. They uh, fell for the book and, and uh, gave it a quite good start. And later, um, I found that I also had to get a, say, broader uh, uh, marketing approach, and uh, then I contacted uh, Wat Watkins, uh, Fiona uh, Robinson, and she graciously accepted my appliance to get into the Watkins family, and here I am today with you. <laughs> Uh, one kind of uh, what we'd uh, qualify, I think, is a good synchronicity to, to use uh, the Jungian term for meaningful coincidences was that uh, I was a bit doubtful whether or not I would uh, manage to, to, to go into this, really. So I, at the time, I was uh, considering also another option um, because I needed some money. So I, either I could go for writing this book or I could go for uh, just uh, study some subject in the university, some more subjects, and then I would easily get a student loan because Norwegian state wants people really to take uh, education. So uh, for two or three months, I was uh, pondering uh, the student loan or the book project, the student loan or the book project, the student loan and the book projects. And because probably because I'm a lazy nature, uh, I ended first on the student loan. And then I sent an SMS to the phone company. There's the service where you can get the phone numbers. And I sent uh, an SMS and asking the phone company, please send me the phone number uh, to the bank for the student loan. And what they sent me back was the number to the Writers Guild. So that's quite special, asking the phone company to send you. And of course, they did not know at all about my mental process. Uh, I asked for the number for the bank for the student loan and got back the phone number for the writer's guild. And I checked my phone on the, in the sent box. Have I really sent some, could I have sent some wrong message, you know, uh, and mixing things uh, or like that? But no, I had asked for the bank number, but I got the number from the writer's guild. So I took that as a strong uh, synchronicity and a hint from the universe which direction to go so i applied for scholarship from the writers guild did not get it in the first round but get in the second and that started the whole process so that was a kind of crossroads where i felt the paranormal hint the synchronicity helped me find a way but, uh, then i was kind of uh, starting to explore these phenomena. And um, <clears throat> I read an article in the most serious uh, daily uh, journal in Norway, Aftenposten, meaning the Evening Post. And there was a journalist, he had interviewed different psychics, and he was not impressed, except for one. Uh, and uh, this guy had told him uh, that uh, you have just bought a new camera and you will be traveling uh, with this in the north of Africa, but you will go in the opposite direction. He was to visit two towns, and but he, you would m make visit them in the opposite order uh, of what you have planned. And suddenly there will appear a priest wanting to join you on this journey. And this journal, uh, journalist, he was totally stunned because exactly that happened, what that guy had told him. So I thought, this guy I have to talk to. And um, I was going to a date uh, 
uh, the day after. So I, I, I called him. I think he was and at uh, on holiday at a Canary Island uh, out in the Atlantic Sea then, and I asked him, um, "I'm going to this date tomorrow. Can you please tell me about how would that go?" And so, and he told me, "Yes, she likes you quite a lot. I can see that, and it will be very nice." And and so, and I can also tell you, this woman is one meter and sixty four centimeters tall. I don't, uh, I'm not able to convert it into inch and feet, uh, but you know, that's a metric system, one meter and 64 centimeters. Uh, and I went to this date and it became very nice and we chatted and very casually, I asked her, uh, by the way, how tall are you? And then she answered, one meter and 64 centimeters. <laughs> so, you know, it was stunning. How is it possible on the inch to use the English reference here to, to get the height uh, correctly? You know, he did not gi just give me the average height of a Norwegian woman. I checked that also afterwards because the, um, the average woman is higher than, say, what he specified here. Uh, so I called him up the next day and um, I said, how on earth uh, were you able to tell me this? And he laughed and said, I don't know really, but it's more or less when, as when you make a search via Google, you place the search words uh, in the focus and then you uh, press enter and then suddenly lots of information will appear related to your search word. And it's a bit like uh, that when one asked him also, he would focus on your question or the say the subject you asked and then suddenly all this uh, information would appear. And then he had to try to sort it out, what would be relevant, what would be fun, what would be so. Uh, but he was not able to somehow decide what in the first place would appear. So it could be her father's uh, occupation or the color of hair of her brother or like that, but what appeared to him was her height. And he just told me that. Uh, so I was quite impressed by that. And I said, uh, but how do you do it? Uh, and he told me he took it somehow via my subconscious. And I didn't understand what he mean, meant by that. You know, I was quite new to the stuff at, at that time. So, uh, oh, do you kind of read my mind then? Uh, yes, if you're a, a good channel, I can do that, he said. Uh, I was, okay, uh, no, I want to test you, I said. Uh, so um, I live in an old house here in Norway, and it's a big at the front the frontal view of it, it's a big white wall, and in the middle, it's a blue double door. And I told him, now I will try to imagine my house, the front of my house, and you please tell me what you see. So I closed my eyes and started to imagine this white wall with the blue double door in the middle. And he became silent a few seconds, and he said, ah, I can see something white, and I can see something blue. You know, just off the cuff like that. So first he had given me to the T the correct height of the woman I was dating. And then he had, uh, without possibility to check the internet or anything like that, you know, I, I called him and we just went right to into it. Uh, he gave me the two correct colors of my house. So that was a very convincing episode and really instigated a more profound search into the science of parapsychology and yeah, everything uh, scientific about this field. Uh, he passed away some months ago after I wrote the book. Uh, uh, so, uh, but he uh, was uh, most famous as a healer and he is, uh, was visited by uh, uh, lots of international, uh, say, visitors also appeared in this little uh, uh, village. Uh, the reason they call him Snorsaman is uh, the village he was living in, uh, quite north in the Norway, it's called Snorsa. So he was named after the village. Uh, his real name is, uh, or was, Jural Fjesta. And he was a very famous as a healer, so more than 50,000 a patient has visited his little cottage up there. And also lots of doctors have confirmed his healing. So uh, it's not just, you know, people wanting to believe and so. And eventually his uh, ability for creating placebo effects was 
extreme, to put it that way, if you just want to ex explain it as placebo. So uh, I, I read that there was a kind of statement made by seven different doctors about uh, that he was able to cure things that they were not able to cure. So that is uh, his most famous feat, uh, healing sick people. But also as a psychic, he was very famous and uh, he would help the police finding uh, disappeared persons and also the Red Cross. Uh, you know, Norway is quite cold and lots of uh, uh, ice and snow in the winter. And we have uh, therefore quite a number of avalanche launches uh, every winter also. And uh, people get killed in those uh, getting, you know, more or less drowned under the avalanche. So uh, there was a quite famous tragedy uh, where uh, three sisters had uh, been taken by an avalanche and the Red Cross had uh, found two of them and they were both deceased uh, and but they could uh, they were not able to find the third one and uh, the red cross and this story is confirmed by three different newspapers and it's very public and i refer it with links in my book also they uh, the say uh, the, the, the say commander in 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 charge of this uh, uh, what is called a research uh, mission. Uh, he, he called the Snorsaman and said, we are not able to lo uh, 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 locate the third missing person here. And then uh, the Snorsaman uh, asked this uh, psych, uh, Red Cross commander, uh, please imagine the place uh, where you are searching. And he did that somewhat like I did when I was imagining my house. And then the Snorsaman said, ah, Yes, now I can see there is the slope and there is this and there is a little green field below there and go to this green field. She is laying there. And they went to this green field and there she was. And uh, this uh, guy uh, from the Red Cross, he was uh, completely convinced by that because they had a search. Uh, he said they had also themselves planned to search in that uh, district, but they had not, uh, say, come that far yet. And what impressed him the most was the uh, extremely detailed uh, description uh, the Snorsaman was able to give of the whole area with, uh, with the slope and the river and the green field and everything. It, it was like he was, say, viewing it through a kind of a telescope or something, you know, because he has never been in that district personally. It was not his own own uh, uh, home uh, valley it was far far away from his home so how that was possible he could not understand he said so that is many stories many confirmed stories by uh, say Norwegian authorities about these abilities of course the skeptics will deny this and find other explanation for more or less credible kind but you know uh, I am say more than convinced about uh, his abilities I also had the pleasure of talking to him on the phone on several occasions, and I also was impressed was what he was able to do via the phone. So, yeah, he uh, he was uh, a local po a politician for the Labour Party, and he was also uh, he had uh, what is called uh, di uh, it's called uh, uh, dairy uh, milk products. He was a, a official controller of milk products, and he also was working as a kind of uh, a church servant. So he is more like a kind of local folk healer and is also a kind of profound Christian mystic. He was very, very say, steeped in, in Christian, uh, a kind of his personal version of Christian mysticism. And he was uh, therefore never claiming any kind of uh, uh, say benefits or money from any of his patients because it was a kind of service to God what he did. So he, he was not shaman. Uh, he met the Pope. I don't think he's met the Dalai Lama. Uh, he felt a very good connection with the Pope, he told. But uh, I don't know if, if he met, say, other great spiritual figures. Uh, he would certainly not use the way shaman himself. He was very modest. Perhaps he could accept mystic, but uh, I think that would be <laughs> the biggest title he would say and uh, endorse. Discovered his, uh, he was a, a sickly child. And once he was about 10 years uh, of age or like that, he was uh, sick in bed 
uh, with kind of influenza, strong influenza. And then he suddenly, for his inner vision, saw a brook uh, that was a couple of kilometers away from his home, a brook. Uh, uh, and uh, in that brook, uh, in the water, he saw something uh, very shiny. Uh, laying in the brook, in a specific place in that brook. And when he, uh, his, health, uh, his health had recovered, he uh, went, uh, this little boy, uh, he, which he was then, went to this brook and dived down with his arm, exactly where he'd said this blinking and shining object, and up he picked a golden ring. So he had for his inner vision, he discovered his clairvoyance by finding that golden ring, uh, which was later lost by her, uh, his sister, but then he found it again uh, once more. Uh, so that was his spontaneous experience of clairvoyance. And later he found that he was able to do something for people, as he said. He didn't know what he did when he was uh, performing healings, but he just felt he was able to do something for people, and people confirmed that they became better when he did his thing for them. So, uh, But the spontaneous uh, appearing clairvoyance and, uh, uh, and, um, and uh, also the healing appeared spontaneously. But of course, as a, uh, as a devout Christian, he used quite a lot of time in, in deep prayer. So of course, his, say, hour-long prayers uh, probably have increased his listening into this field. Yeah, I could do, do that. But uh, first of all, if someone wants to be, uh, it, it's, uh, um, as uh, many of those calling themselves skeptics are, are as you uh, correctly referred, pseudo skeptics or even deniers or scoffers or what you could say. And of course, if people do not want to believe because they feel their worldview is threatened by new perspectives, what can we do? Nothing really. So, uh, and I discussed this with Dean Raiden and she was you should never waste your time on that really uh, but if you want uh, there might also be of course uh, quite a number of serious skeptics there that want to know uh, uh, skeptics uh, if you go to the uh, etymology what is called etymology uh, etymology of a skepticism it is one who wants to know or to, to discern you know uh, so it's uh, really the opposite of wanting to expand the horizon and then I usually cut short and go directly to an article in uh, American Psychologist. Uh, if people uh, are into psychology, they would probably know that uh, American Psychologist is the most prestigious psychological journal in the world. It is published by the American Psychological Association, APA. And in uh, 2018, in the May issue of this uh, highly prestigious psychological uh, journal. There is a wonderful article uh, by professor uh, in psychology, Etzel Cardenia. He's tenured in Lund, he's from Mexico, and he's also been, uh, uh, you know, have uh, scholarships on, on a couple of uh, great American universities. And he's published uh, about, or even more than 300 peer reviewed scientific articles. Uh, so he is a deadly serious scientist, and this uh, journal is the most prestigious psychological in the world. And his article uh, is named, let me see now, um, it's called The Experimental Evidence for Parapsychological Phenomena, uh, colon, a review. And that article concludes, uh, just to sum it up, uh, that these phenomena are real and supported by experimental evidence. But we have not yet reached an explanatory model that everybody can agree about. So that is his conclusion. In the most prestigious psychological journal in the world, I think they have four professors, uh, uh, say, uh, in addition to, uh, say, the editor and, uh, and his staff, uh, they have uh, four different professors uh, to somehow review the article for 
publication, otherwise it will be thrown in the bin. So uh, I usually refer serious skeptics to that article because uh, it is so good in so many respects, and it's also very concentrated. It's not a lot of dead meat there. It's very uh, essential in every respect, and it's not very long uh, also. And uh, there is even lots of uh, references at the end. So it's a very good starting point for, say, more research into this field. So that article, go there and you will find what you seek. <laughs> Uh, definitely, because these are not part of our ego. Uh, my view uh, of consciousness it is a collective phenomenon. It's not just something we have inside our heads. So uh, that is, say, the basis, uh, the, the ontology uh, here. Uh, if you view consciousness just something inside your head, uh, then you must be a quite exceptional human being to somehow c communicate telepathically with other. But if the really uh, our consciousness deep down uh, is linked together with all other human consciousness, uh, people in Australia, people in Siberia, people in South America, and so if we share a, col of, a collective field of consciousness, then telepathy is not hard to imagine at all, because we are really uh, communicating via the same uh, say web, and that is uh, where I bring in the concept of the mental internet, which is some kind of popular version of this collective consciousness field theory. Uh, because just as you uh, are able to download lots of information uh, from uh, the, the electronic internet, I think a sensitive person will be able to download clairvoyantly lots of information from this mental internet, this vast information field we all share and all are connected to. But as um, the questioner correctly says, of course, uh, uh, talent will vary in this. And uh, I usually compare that to music. And everybody is able to sing for their own pleasure in the shower, but you should not go to Carnegie Hall and give a concert, you know. So. It's always difficult because I was not there. Uh, I was there when this guy told me the height of this girl I was today about to date, and I was there when he told me the color of uh, of my house, you know, and and different other uh, occasions where I have been present in in uh, of uh, in, in the presence of paranormal manifestations. But uh, home, it's so long, and I see some say it's just uh, I read quite a lot about him, and so conclude it's just a clever fraud, and some says no, he's the real thing, and so uh, it's just, it's difficult when the evidence is so far away in uh, in in time. Uh, so, but uh, to make it more, uh, uh, and also people uh, invest. Uh, a bit too much energy. Uh, so I could answer in a more general way. I think I think the phenomenon of levitation is real, but whether or not he was faking his levitations, I I am not able to 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 prove or disprove. It was a famous uh, famous Scottish uh, medium. Uh, uh, I should uh, I was about to say English, but I think he was Scottish, and uh, he was uh, in uh, living in the uh, late Victorian times. And he did demonstration of levitation, uh, and his body is said to have flo floated out of the window in one window and floated back into another window. And he was also able to uh, telepathically, no, um, telekinetically control instruments and uh, get a violin. And, and uh, here he made a, a pun on his own name. Uh, the violin played "Home, Sweet Home." <laughs> um, Douglas Home made that happen, they say. So uh, he was excelling apparently in telekinesis, telekinesis uh, at the late 19th century and very famous for this. But as I said, some claim that he had used the wires for that and so on. So it's, uh, and uh, so I like to focus uh, rather on the phenomenon of telepathy, uh, uh, telekinesis, which I'm uh, totally convinced is real. Uh, but whether or not he was a fake or fall, I, I cannot say. But uh, you have, for instance, this uh, modern Italian mystic, uh, uh, Catholic mystic, uh, uh, pa uh, Padre Pio, uh, Father Pio, and he is, uh, uh, has been, uh, say, watched by many, he is in congregation levitating before the altar and so, and I don't think he had 
uh, you know, virus uh, <laughs> lifting him up just to simulate levitation, you know. So either he has projected strongly a telepathic image of himself uh, moving up in there, or he was physically moving up in there. But I was not there either, so I cannot say. But uh, clearly, there was special phenomenon uh, appearing uh, when he, say, held mass in his church. So, and also lots of other, other people uh, having experienced levitation. I can give you a, a cool little example. Um, father of a friend of mine, he was a farmer, um, and he was uh, out uh, with his tractor and plowing the fields. Uh, but uh, at the end of the field, there was a kind of uh, what is called uh, not a cliff, but, you know, uh, a steep hill where you could fall uh, down. Uh, it was nine meters, what is called a uh, precipice. Is, is that the word? Yeah, OK, precipice. So he get too close uh, to the edge there. So the, the earth started sliding out and suddenly he and his tractor fell off this precipice. And as I said, uh, at least as um, I was told the story by his son, it was nine meters down. And the tractor fell down with a bang, boof, like that, you know. And then the father came afterwards, and he was falling, 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 landing very slowly like that, not hurt at all after a fall of nine meters. So that's quite impressive. So that would be kind of spontaneous, call it kind of levitation then. Uh, just uh, to get back to, to, to the model of consciousness, if consciousness is a collective uh, information field, which is a kind of premise uh, in my book then, um, then you have, uh, what is the role of the say the individual mind or, or and uh, and or the or probably both than the mind and, and the brain then and uh, from an old uh, say um, uh, say a description of this uh, from the English academic from the late Victorian times Frederick Myers and also the great uh, uh, say the father of American psychology William James we have this filter model uh, that bra uh, brain is not creating consciousness but it's reducing and filtering consciousness so uh, then we have all this information that uh, out there which is, enables uh, telepathy, enables clairvoyance, but uh, our normal limited, uh, say, consciousness um, is, uh, acts like a firewall uh, that make it impossible or at least difficult for this information to, to reach us. But during sleep, for instance, then uh, the filters are on a little vacation and the filtering function is weaker, and then this information can, uh, can come through. Uh, that is one way. You could also, of course, uh, go into trance by ecstasy, by dancing, for instance. Uh, then you will also, uh, say, uh, weaken the filtering function. Or you could take LSD together with the sound set and setting so we don't get psychotic, but then you will also lower the filtering. Or you can get the brain damage, as we have seen in um, some uh, of these savants, these uh, autists with uh, exceptional abilities, uh, people getting head, uh, the famous case I mentioned in my book, uh, a boy uh, getting hit by a baseball in the head, getting a minor brain damage, and after that he was turning into a savant, being able to remember the weather each day 10 years back in time and like that. And we have also, I interviewed a couple of American psychics and they told me that they got their psychic abilities after near death experience. One after drowning, the other after a car crash, which left her clinically dead for 11 minutes. And after when she came back, um, uh, she's found herself psychic to her own astonishment because before that she was not into that field at all. But clearly this near-death uh, death trauma had, say, blown away the filters, so she was totally open to take in, say, all, all or at least much of the information in this collective field. So uh, that is some ways, but uh, the most proper 
uh, ways uh, in the esoteric tradition is different kind of meditation uh, because you can uh, learn to somehow alter your brainwave pattern. Uh, shamanic drumming can be if you go to the uh, theta uh, pattern uh, uh, in shamanic drumming, four to seven beats a second, then this seems to induce this kind of phenomena uh, quite uh, often. Uh, shamans uh, all over the world use this kind of auditive techniques. Uh, also, uh, this uh, classic yoga postures with breathing meditation and so because you're getting more fine tuned and somehow also you suspend the rational mind that somehow does not go all too well together with these phenomena because it's confusing. So, so the dream state, uh, a kind of psychedelic induced state, a trance state, uh, even brain damage or so, every say um, everything that will weaken the filtration between the ego and the collective field of of information will see dispose you for experience more of this but i i would recommend uh, say trance techniques like meditation and shamanic drumming and that if people are seriously uh, interested in it. also um, these uh, audio tracks with uh, uh, neural beats uh, where you can uh, uh, brain and train uh, brain entrainment where you can somehow learn your brain to to uh, change gear um, the, the, these uh, kind of uh, audio tracks can be very helpful i used one of uh, say for for some years i used uh, one brand of those tracks i will not make commercials here but uh, there are serious uh, serious uh, firms making very good uh, binaural beats that uh, people can use so um, yes meditation uh, trance techniques and binaural beats then you will be helped uh, quite a lot and if i may add also um, i think it's important like the buddhists you should always ask the, the existential question why do you want to is it because you're eager you want to impress your friends in the party you know or uh, want you let's hope not get power over other people's mind you know so if you have this uh, attitude that you want to know in order to serve then i think it's a good idea to to try to develop these things but otherwise i think it's you should say not use it uh, if friend of mine, or I should say acquaintance rather, he is a grandmaster of a not black, but gray order, occult order. And you know, I, they are very much into power plays and like that. And he really has some paranormal powers. Uh, I no doubt about that, but you know, the vibes around these guys are not good. It's uh, the black metal milieu, black, Norwegian black metal are quite famous. You know, they, some 10, uh, 15 years ago, they burned lots of churches and even killed each other, you know? And uh, so that's not the way you want the paranormal to, to to work in your life. I write, uh, uh, say quite a bit about that in my book uh, also. Uh, what is time really? That is a long discussion where there's no clear answer, but at least uh, some of the perspectives I can, I can mention here is uh, what is, uh, there was, um, the so-called so B theory of time. Uh, it uh, was a Scottish uh, philosopher, John McTaggart. He wrote a book, I think it was 1908. It's called The Unre uh, Unreality of Time. And he launches the B theory of time, uh, which is more, uh, we in our days usually refer to as block time or uh, eternalism. And that is uh, uh, because usually when we think of time, we think of a timeline, time is linear. But from, say, the block time, the eternalist uh, uh, perspective, the B theory of a time, uh, in fact, very much in favor with uh, many, um, say, quantum physicists, then time is one big now. But we are not able to uh, perceive this one big no all at once. So we split it up and stretch it out in a long line. Uh, so that is very often that so, but in altered states of consciousness, you might be able to somehow roll the thing back again to, to uh, perceive the eternal now more or less. So if you think of time is uh, again, our brain, our mind is rather a filter that gives us a matrix with linear time. Uh, and uh, Albert Einstein, he said, the only reason for time is so that not everything is going to happen at once. 
<laughs> I think that's a good one because that will be extremely confusing. So we have to make things simpler for us, not to be totally uh, overwhelmed by this. And, and many psychics also get uh, problems, uh, overload of information. They get confused. You know, if you see future accidents, what are you supposed to do about them? Can you hinder them? If you call the the airport and say I saw flight number so and so would be crashing, they will call the guys. In with the with the white coats, you know, and get you, uh, uh, and or even the in the black coats and uh, police hats, you know. So uh, you should somehow be a bit uh, careful, uh, uh, wanting to expand your mind too much. You might be right, but what would be the consequences for your private life? And would be you be able to somehow act on it in a constructive uh, way? It's a fantastic Norwegian book. It's not translated. It's called Experiences from an Unknown World, written by, uh, by a Norwegian lawyer. And he very often got visions about terrible things that was about to happen in the future. And how on earth I'm to deal with this in a constructive manner. And uh, it's not easy at all. As I said, people will think you are crazy or you scare the shit out of them or you might even not be able to hinder it even if you try, you know. So it's very confusing when time stops not acting linear. But again, uh, the existential aspect, if you're asking for your meaning or with your life, which direction to go and so, then I think you can get, for instance, through uh, lucid dreams or, or, or kind of uh, oracular techniques, uh, divination, or, uh, divination or so, then it is possible because then you have the talisman, you have the focus, uh, and, and then you can get kind of meaningful uh, answer to questions uh, via, say, getting into this eternal now that I think might be there uh, on one level. Uh, but just dabbling into it just by curiosity, well, it may, might be a start, but it's not the best way to proceed to get a healthy a relationship with the paranormal. I think um, also in the old Jewish tradition, you know, you could go to the high priest and ask, uh, he had a kind of oracular stones uh, in his uh, on his breastplate it's uh, they were were called urin and tummin uh, and he could throw them and look for patterns and interpret that to give you advice if you were very doubtful about the kind of decision what to do and so but you should never ask it uh, unless in a kind of existential crisis because otherwise the answer could be part just be part of the con confusion uh, so uh, be serious about it but i think it's possible to get uh, uh, I should perhaps not say that, but I, I have seen in the future several times myself, you know, uh, so, so I, I know from experience it's possible, but um, how to use it in a constructive manner, not just, as I said, like a kind of entertainment, so, so I think you should somehow emulate the, the Buddhists, uh, they will always uh, make you discern uh, how is this working in your, um, uh, say, personal development. The great Zen Buddhist master Thich Nhat Hanh, he passed away a couple of weeks ago, as you probably know, yes. And he said, it's a greater miracle to, work, uh, to walk on the earth than to walk on water. So uh, keep it real. Yeah, yeah, it's an excellent question. I am no expert in uh, numerology, so I will not uh, have any authority in this field at all. Uh, but what I, uh, and there might be, because in you know, the old uh, Pythagorean tradition and even the Platonic tradition, numbers are ontological uh, entities. They are not just numbers counting things, they are part of the the deep structure of the world. So when they manifest, somehow it's an aspect of the world that's become manifested through that number. Uh, so that is a very interesting aspect. Um, it's a deep philosophical question also, if you follow up that, because um, you know mathematicians, they also discuss uh, how is it possible that mathematics can give us a, a so say correct picture of nature. Is uh, mathematics somehow uh, an integral part of nature, uh, or is it just our clever brains that have a, make, made a system that so, uh, say, uh, stunningly correct is able to describe the world? Uh, so there are schools of mathematicians there. Uh, they are not, uh, do not agree. Uh, but uh, say, uh, appearing angel, angel, uh, angel numbers and that, uh, of course, uh, numerologists would say you should pay extremely much attention to that. But 
I am also of that opinion that there can be kind of bugs in this. I will give you an example. A photographer uh, I know, he uh, was very famous in Norway all the time. See, he is a pensioner now. And he is also quite gifted in the paranormal. And he had a dig uh, digital watch on his bed, you know, this kind of alarm clock. Um, and uh, when he uh, wake up during the night and he turned his head watching the alarm clock, it was either uh, showing 111 or 222 or 333 or 444 or 555, but never 666. That was what he was afraid of, of course. But how come? And he tried to trick it. So when he uh, woke up in the middle of the night, he said to himself, no, I will wait a few seconds and then turn my head. And then he turned his head and it was three equal numbers, you know. So it seems to be just kind of bug is in his subconscious that reproduced itself by because he was so fixated on this, both by fascination, but also by fear for this 666 message, you know. So his fixation somehow reproduced and reproduced and reproduced and reproduced the phenomenon. Was that existential very meaningful? Was it from the uh, angelic realm? I don't think so. It was just a personal bug. And I think, I think, I don't know but i think these bugs are also possible to reproduce in the collective field if many people watch a television program extremely popular where so and so happens they somehow reproduce they think they feel related to that and it produces lots of lots of lots and thoughts about this specific figure you know and that then this figure may certainly appear much more often in people's dreams i find that highly likely uh, the great professor and parapsychologist stanley krippner he has made uh, collective telepathic experiments on rock concert in the 70s with this uh, cult band Grateful Dead and they managed to project collective pictures uh, by big by the help of big crowd using as, uh, the crowd as an amplifier of the pictures so there are so many levels in understanding these phenomena uh, so the angelic uh, messaging is one thing uh, the bug theory that I mentioned now is another I am not the one to say which is uh, so you, people have just to research the stuff from themselves. That, that, that's a great question. And of course, I, I, I launch different uh, models of consciousness that might be able to explain this. And uh, uh, as uh, I will again refer to Cardenas article that the phenomena are real and supported by experimental evidence, but we have not yet reached uh, see, the model that everybody are ready to accept as the model for this field. So, but um, there are many uh, models. Uh, one is, for instance, uh, this, uh, uh, by um, the, the British uh, last year Nobel uh, Prize winner in physics, Sir Roger Penrose, uh, that is called orc or it means uh, orchestrated reduction. Um, and that model, uh, uh, Penrose himself, uh, by no means uh, a new age. He said that probably this model of consciousness uh, will, uh, say, allow for precognition, as, as he has said. And uh, he is a Nobel Prize winner in physics. And he's worked together with uh, American and anesthesiologist Stuart Hameroff. And Hameroff, uh, you can find interviews with him on YouTube. And he says that uh, probably also uh, this model uh, of this of consciousness will allow for for uh, telepathy uh, by by uh, based on the phenomenon called quantum uh, non locality. And uh, I could refer the most famous experiment. Uh, perhaps everybody knows it, but um, it, it's called the twin photon experiment or the aspect uh, experiment after. Uh, Elaine Aspect, a uh, famous uh, French physicist. Uh, to make it very simple, if you collide two electrons in a kind of a, a, a accelerator and uh, they collide, and in this collis uh, collision, it is made two photons, particles of light, and they will hurtle off in exact opposite direction. And what is really wondrous is that if one of those uh, photons, say being now 10 miles apart, if one turns up, the other will turn down. It once turn left, the other will turn right. So they are continue. They continue to act as a unity, even if divided uh, in what we usually refer to as space. So our conception of space is clearly not. Uh, 
really profound because on a deep level, these uh, photons are still connected. They act as a unity. How is that possible? Uh, so, and then you have the phen this phenomenon, uh, phenomenon is called uh, non-locality. And what if not only electrons or photons uh, work that way, but even uh, our consciousness? Perhaps consciousness is basically a non-local phenomenon. That uh, might explain telepathy, for instance. For clearly, our conception of space is dead wrong on a deep level. So that might be one model. There, there are so many, it's quite complicated stuff. And I discussed that the one who launches the right model here will probably get a string of Nobel prizes. So yeah. And uh, what is my uh, issue here? Uh, you know, I started out not with the theory, but with the phenomena. And if you have phenomena that uh, exist, but you have no map that uh, have uh, described this phenomena, uh, then you can, of course, as the skeptics, try to remove the phenomena or you can try to redraw the map. And I prefer the latter solution. So uh, then you have to get a good craftsman or women to, to make this drawing, uh, say, uh, open-minded physicist. Like we have this beautiful guy in, uh, in Cambridge, Brian Josephson. He won the Nobel Prize in physics in, in 1973. And he won it together with a Norwegian. Therefore, I know quite a lot about that. Uh, Eva Jäver, uh, who is a climate skeptic, by the way, but that is an other other path to take. But Brian Josephson, he you can go to his website on the University of Cambridge. He won the Nobel Prize in 1973 and is generally considered a genius. And he says he is totally convinced about the ex existence of telepathy and also uh, psychokinesis. And he thinks that quantum, lo uh, quantum locality, as I described very briefly here, just uh, might be part of the explanation for telepathy. Yeah, definitely. As you uh, mentioned, Hegel, uh, he, he uh, says clearly that uh, these phenomena are real, but he was not positive toward them uh, because he said it, they tend to appear when you are unbalanced, uh, when the, the soul and the mind uh, are uh, intertwined in an unsound way. Uh, he probably had to visit uh, uh, asylums, you know, and seeing people being able to telepathically uh, pick up things, but, you know, uh, they uh, are, uh, were unbalanced. But he said, that his philosophy has the advantage um, uh, compared to materialist philosophy that his philosophy are able to include and explain these phenomena even if he is not positive uh, he, do he doesn't like them but they are there and we have to explain them and his philosophy uh, would be able to do that but uh, the materialist philosophy uh, was not and therefore his philosophy is truer than the materialist philosophy. And also Kant, uh, as I mentioned, is a wonderful story where Kant uh, explores this uh, clairvoyant, uh, strong experiences of Emanuel Swedenborg and, and, uh, and uh, subscribes to uh, them, not in public, but in a personal letter that I quote uh, in, in my, my, my book. So, uh, and, and Kant also, and also, of course, Arthur Schopenhauer, the grim pessimist of, uh, of German, say, romantic philosophy. He was totally convinced about this and had experienced many of these phenomena himself and, and thought himself to be partly gifted in this field. He was able to uh, reproduce, uh, he was asked in a party uh, from uh, the uh, <laughs> uh, ravish uh, hostess, um, asked him, uh, I have placed three numbers, uh, or, or my bet on three numbers in the lottery. Which are those three numbers? And he gave the first number right, and he gave the second number right, but then he become a get kind of performance anxiety and uh, just lost it on the third one. But he, as I said, the two first numbers were, uh, were correct. So, uh, and we have it all, you know, and uh, they is, is sociologists of religion have uh, made uh, uh, statistics about that. And uh, more than half of the grown up population in Western countries uh, have had some kind of paranormal experience. So uh, why should we explain away these things? 
paintings and uh, I, I compare often to when uh, uh, you know in antiquity they saw these uh, meteorites uh, crossing the heavens and uh, they did not have any explanation good explanation for them but they saw the meteorites should they just deny this so uh, but then eventually came the good model ah oh, the you know it's little pieces of rock traveling so now and then it touches the atmosphere of the earth and the friction makes uh, catch fire and so so is uh, I think quantum biology we get that, that with these uh, uh, might uh, be able to give us models that uh, can explain at least to some extent uh, these phenomena. Uh, also, the model is a really important thing here because you, if you have established in your mind a model that these uh, phenomena cannot uh, <laughs> uh, happen. Of course, every story about uh, it must be bogus. Um, so uh, a, a doctor, a friend of mine here in my hometown, he is trying to reform the health service here. And so, and he always speaks about the might of the model. If the, it, you, the model is in place, it will somehow uh, control your thinking within the field. And I think that is, uh, if people have fallen in love on some level with say a kind of skeptical reductionist model uh, of reality, they are not willing to, to, uh, to let it go. And it will also um, uh, invariably uh, limit the scope and the interpretation of, of whole, uh, this field. So it's, uh, that is what uh, you also refer to the word paradigm, uh, which was launched in the book, uh, The Structure of the Scientific Revolution by Thomas Kuhn in 1962. Uh, and uh, he says the irrational factors somehow uh, making the, the framework of, of uh, scientific practices. So scientists, are not as rational as they like to think they are. Uh, they are somehow, it could be prestigious. You have got uh, tenure, you've got scholarships, you have written 10 books, you've got a mentor based on certain uh, premises, certain models, certain paradigms. And then you are not easily let go of this, even if some uh, say disturbing footnote, uh, footnotes pops up now and then and says this cannot be true this cannot be true you push it down boy down down like that you know if your model does not allow them to come up and and flourish Yes, uh, my book uh, you can find, of course, on uh, on uh, Watkins' uh, homepage, but you can also buy it on uh, the big uh, web shops like Amazon.co.uk. Um, and um, uh, my book has a web page. If you go to Amazon, you can also find a link to uh, the book's web page. People can, of course, find me on Facebook, Ty Simonsen, if they like. But uh, it's the book's uh, web page on Facebook that have the interviews and the information and uh, all that things. My project is uh, somehow uh, to promote the book. Uh, it uh, is out in Czech language this October. And it is by now uh, in Spain being evaluated for possible uh, translation into Spanish. And I hope, of course, for that, because then we have Latin America, which have a great tradition for the paranormal. So I really hope uh, they will take it. And, uh, you know, I give interviews like this uh, lit uh, little nice chat we have had now and uh, try to somehow go spread the word. Uh, after I have been doing that for a couple of years or so, I probably will write a next book, but somehow you have to get a breakthrough for one book first, then it's much more easier to come with uh, number two. So yeah, I do the promotional work these days. Uh, that is one of my own personal favorite as well. So thank you for mentioning that. The most uh, famous uh, card reader in uh, all uh, history, uh, French woman, uh, so exciting stories with big, big politics and intrigues and uh, everything that a good story should contain. So, And the book has also won a couple of prizes in the US, the Parapsychological Book uh, Association Book Award it has won, and also a Silver Nautilus Award, the same as Dalai Lama won some years ago so i'm in a good a good company there bye bye to all bye bye good night